Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kim Ricketts, and I co-manage, along with Kirsten Wiley, the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. Today, we welcome Sam Gosling to Microsoft Research to poke in our office drawers, study our messy desks, and examine our outfits. But not actually, not really. But that is what he does, and why. Because as an award-winning psychologist, researcher, and professional voyeur, he has found that a lot of information is found in the code behind how we organize and arrange our world. You can fake anything in some contexts. Parties, job interviews, dates, second life. But the stuff you keep in your car or on your iPod, this actually can reveal the real you. Aside from being fascinating, there are useful applications for all of this research. And I'm hoping we can get a bit into that today with Sam as we discuss Snoop, what your stuff says about you. So please join me in welcoming Sam Gosling to Microsoft Research. Cool. cool. Well, thank, thank you so much uh, for having me. So I'm... Uh, I understand this is a book reading y thing, but I'm not. I was told that uh, reading from a non fiction book is self indulgent. And, uh, and believe me, I'm not beyond being self indulgent, but today I will uh, spare you. Now, I'm experimenting today. Today, I'm going to experiment with a PowerPoint. Um, I normally just talk, but I'm going to. I think I can show you some spaces this way, but i highly ambivalent. This, oh, this is the wrong. I'm highly ambivalent about PowerPoint. That's the wrong place. Uh, 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 because, you know, it's just going to attract your attention. So I'm going to put up a few photos just for the hell of it, but they don't, doesn't really mean much. Um, okay. Um, so I'm going to just talk, talk really about some of the ideas behind this book, why I'm interested in it, why I'm doing it, why you may or may not be interested in it. And um, then I'll uh, maybe talk a little bit about some sort of snooping tips and maybe, oh, and if I have time, I'll talk about uh, one uh, application of, of these ideas uh, 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 that's uh, going on right now. Okay, so is there a photo? Yeah, okay, so there is a photo of, that is a photo of, uh, from one of the studies we did. So in one of the studies we did, we looked at people's uh, dorm rooms. Um, and this is a, this is a, a dorm room um, at, a, at a, well, it's a dorm room. Um, uh, okay, and so... Um, I'm interested in snooping. I think there are sort of two broad re reasons why, um, uh, w the two broad topics that this book covers. The first is what the title says, snooping. That is, what can you learn about others by snooping around their spaces, um, snooping around their offices, their, um, uh, their uh, living spaces, and so on. And what, obviously, the other side of that same coin is, what, what might they be learning about you? when they come into your space? What impressions are they forming? Which of those impressions are correct? Which ones tend to be incorrect? What kinds of things can you pick up about people? But the other um, part of the book, which, which isn't really emphasized in the title, but I think is, is interesting, and that is just really trying to think about the connections between us and the spaces uh, we select and craft around ourselves. What are, how is it that we relate to these spaces? And I think we, 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 when we're creating a space, whether it's a space in a cubicle or an office or in a home, we, we don't sort of think about what psychological function is this serving. It's just, just something feels right. Of, of, of the 10,000 photos that you could put up in your office, why this one? Why did you put up this photo rather than another one? Right? It's not right, and you're, you're not thinking, oh, it's serving a certain psychological thing. You just, you just think that's nice. Or, or, or why do you keep this memento, this little you know, s snow globe of Disneyland or whatever it is? Why, why, why was that important? Why was it meaningful? So it's really just helping us to think about how we relate to the spaces around us. Um, and um, I, look, I, I, I construe um, uh, spaces, uh, I, uh, when I say space, pretty broadly. So I'm looking at people's uh, office spaces and their uh, personal living spaces. There, there, there are some office spaces and living spaces. Uh, also looking at what I call virtual environments. They're not really, but I look at people's websites. Uh, also recently done quite a lot of work looking at people's uh, Facebook profiles and other social networking sites, which I think are very interesting uh, new types of environments. And oral environments too, so people's music collections. What, um, what um, 
music people select as a, as, as a way you can very, very quickly change your environment just by changing something on, on the, uh, uh, on the uh, iPod. Um, okay, so let's go back. So here are, here are some spaces from another study we did, these, these um, uh, study of office spaces. It, it's, is, 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 can the lighting be made better, or, or is that as good as it gets? You know, you know. Oh, look at that. Thank you, Henry. How did they know that? <laughs> that is astonishing. Okay. Um, uh, okay. So, so, so here are some spaces for you to look at. I'd actually rather, rather than you um, looking at these spaces, it'd be, I think it's sort of more interesting to think about your own spaces. Think about your own home spaces, your own office spaces, and and uh, when when we're snooping and when you're snooping, there are sort of, sort of a number of different ways to think about it. The obvious way is to think about, well, what is that item? What items do you have in your space? So take something like a, a desk calendar, right? You may, maybe you have a desk calendar. Some people have them, some people don't. So that you have a desk calendar says something. But really, you need to go well beyond that. You need to go well beyond thinking, what are the items? You need to look at the state of those items. What condition are the items in? It's, it's all very well to have a desk calendar, but do you use it? Is it a used desk calendar, right? Many people, and you know, I'll talk about this in a little bit perhaps, is, uh, you, know, is you have aspirations, right? There's, as we, we have aspirations, well, I'm going to get my life together, I'm going to get organized, I'm going to get a desk calendar, and that, that's going to do it, right? <laughs> uh, but, it, but it's not, right? And so you'll often see desk calendars, and the first few pages have been filled out assiduously, and then, you know, it's, it's neglected. So, uh, so really, so the state of it, you have a desk calendar, but is it used? Is it used consistently? Are they using the proper coloring system? Are they a consistent coloring system as they go through it? What are they doing? Are they putting big stars for birthdays? Are they putting big stars for, for social events and smaller things for work events? So you can look at the state of it. Um, also, and I think this really speaks to the psychological function that a lot of objects serve, what is the location or orientation of an object? So um, one of the things that I like to look at when I go into people's uh, 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 office spaces, um, uh, and you can see some examples of these things here, is, is photos. Family photos, for example, or photos of um, pets or, 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 or meaning, meaningful things that we have, and we often put them in frames in our offices. Um, now, the orientation, you could have the very, very same thing, the very same photo, but its placement and orientation. How that differs tells you about the psychological function. How do you have that photo? If, you have, if you're in, some, if you're in your um, office space and you have the photo facing yourself, then, then it's what we, what we uh, would call a social snack. Wendy Gardner has done some research on social snacks. And that is we're snacking, we're, taking, we're just taking a little emotional snack to save us through this. So maybe it's a, it's a photo of you and your spouse or a photo of your baby or something like that. And you're isolated, you're away from these loved ones or you haven't been to a place for a long time and you can work away and then just take a little look and say, ah, oh, there's the baby and then get back to it. <laughs> and and so, 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 so it's really kind of... Uh, uh, useful that way. But you could take the very same object, right? And, some, and often you see this in people's desks and they have it turned around. They have it facing the others, right? And so there, it's not about serving this, this personal emotional role. What it's doing here is it's sending a signal to others. It's saying, this is who I am. Look at me. Look, my beautiful spouse. Look at uh, my baby. Look at what I've done. Now, just because we are sending signals to others, I think, you know, the assumption is often that when you send a signal to others, what it's doing is it's a kind of a, a manipulative strategy. You're trying to get people to see you in a, in a, in a certain way. Well, I, th I think most, most of the time that's not true. There's been a lot of research over the past uh, couple of decades which says, you know, most of the time people just want to be known. They're not trying to be seen in a positive light. They want to be known. They want you to see, they want you to see them as they see themselves. And when that's true... When that's true, people are happier, healthier, and more productive. So, so just because somebody's trying to get you to see them a certain way, that doesn't necessarily mean they're trying to pull the wool over your eyes. They're just trying to be known. We, we'd want to be known. Um, so, so, so it's really important you know, when you're thinking about objects and go into a space, and I think it's useful to go and look at your own objects again and think, okay, why am I doing that? What, what, was, what was important um, ab uh, about, uh, about uh, that item? How did it get there? Um, okay, so here, those are some spaces. So now, um, 
again, I'm going to show you some photos of other objects in, in, in people's um, uh, uh, living spaces uh, from one of the studies we did. Um, but also, I, I encourage you to think about your own objects, the, your own objects in your own places as, as we do this. And, uh, and I try to um, um, uh, um, think of these, uh, of um, uh, the items in a space as falling into one of sort of three broad categories. It's, it's not a perfect system, but it's one way of thinking about it. And the first is, is what I uh, call um, identity claims. So identity claims are deliberate statements we make to the world. So the photo here, the photo of you, uh, of your kid sitting in a framed thing here. Um, so the, or, uh, th these are classic examples. So things people put on their doors, so this is a dorm room door, but on your office door, or on the outside of your cubicle, or in a place in a cubicle where other people can really see it, right? This is what I call an identity claim here. Be your own goddess or something, put a brain in the White House, and a whole bunch of other stuff all over here about... Uh, about we are really telling statements to others. And this is a really good example because you know who to attribute it to, right? You know who, who this should be. So like, you know, you might have posters of well-known of well, well -known icons. You have a poster of JFK, right? You have a poster of JFK on your wall. People come in, they know what that means, and you're projecting your values and goals and uh, attitudes uh, to other people. Those can also be, though, directed to the self. And how we would know that is how they're placed. So if you have a poster of JFK on the outside of the door, that says one thing. If you have a poster like right by your computer monitor, again, that's, that's helping, is get, allowing you to resonate with your sense of self and think, okay, uh, and you connect with your values and so on. So, so these, are, th these are identity claims. Um, the next class of, um, the next class of uh, um, uh, objects um, are what I call um, uh, feeling regulators. So this, this isn't a great example, but I just put the photo up uh, for the fun of it. But if you think that when we, 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 we often, when we are trying to change how we feel, we change the environment we go to. So if you want to focus and concentrate, you go to a library or somewhere quiet, you don't go to a nightclub. If you want to get pumped up and get, get re you know, really going, you go to a nightclub or you go somewhere lively and active, not not a quiet place. So we often change our locations, but sometimes we don't need to move. We can change the location we're in. As I mentioned before, one of the very easy ways we can do that is with music. Now, with music, we can put on some lively music, we can put on relaxing music, we can put on you know, sad, happy music. There are all kinds of ways we can change the environment just uh, with music. But, we, but we, we also can change the space physically. We can put up um, things that affect how we feel. I was recently asked for a magazine to look at a whole bunch of uh, photographs of people's bathrooms. And there you see great variation of how people are setting up the space in order to make them feel differently. One of the bathrooms was, it was set up as a kind of a tranquil haven, somewhere, somewhere somebody could go and recharge their batteries. So here it's sort of soft lighting. There are a whole bunch of candles which, which have been used around, you know, used candles around, a whole bunch of uh, things to make your bath smell nice. Uh, magazines nearby, soft lighting, uh, gentle pictures. So some, clearly somebody goes into this space to relax and escape from it all. Another one of the um, bathrooms we looked at was very different. It was highly stimulating. It was very brightly lit. There was a, bit, a whole series of shelves right across from the shower which had an enormous collection of plastic, different colored plastic goldfish and plastic ducks and things like that there. There was a big trophy, a big silver trophy sitting there. Um, I, I, don't, you know, I couldn't see what the trophy was, but that, it was, that is this about getting this person motivated, getting this person excited, getting this person up and ready today. So we often do that. You know, so there's a lot of the things we do here. Maybe these flowers are here. Um, you know, I don't know, I'm just saying that because that's the photo I happen to have. But, um, so, you know, are there in order to make us feel, feel a certain way. So those are two broad classes, identity claims and feeling regulators. Um, another, another uh, and the third class is in some ways the most interesting. It's, it's what I call behavioral residue. So the residue, and that is the residue, uh, the inadvertent residue of our actions. So we do a whole bunch of stuff in our lives. We do a whole bunch of stuff. A subset of the things we do, not all of them, but a, su a subset of the things we do leave a trace in the environment. So by looking at that trace, so looking at the residue in the environment, you can reason back to the behavior and then back uh, to what you th the personality is driving that behavior. So, you know, obvious examples here, you know, read this reading behavior. Now you can look at what the person does in terms of what is the content of the books. You can look inside, have they been really read? 
Have they, um, you know, do they have notes inside them? Have they been organized? Have, you know, all, all kinds of things you can look at. So this is, this is evidence of activity. It may be, it may be evidence of constrained activity. It may not, it, you may be able to figure out, okay, this is a course that, in this case, a student's room that the, that the student took and therefore those interests. You can also see other, other types of activities. Uh, so this, this was one, right? So here is this, here we see the residue of not tidying up behavior, okay? <laughs> and, so all kinds, and there's all kinds of things here that you see. Um, um, and so, again, this is a clear case of behavioral residue where people, where the, the, the action or inaction in this case is, is, is left in the person's space. A good, good example of behavioral residue. What's uh, interesting for this, right, is this was one of the, the, uh, the bed, this was one of the rooms in, our, in one of our studies. And people often say to me, well, surely before you sent your team in, Everybody tidied up their space. Well, this, well, this person may have tidied up, but uh, I, I don't know what it looked like before. If that, if that is the, if that's true. Okay, so let me tell you um, a little bit about how we do some of these studies, um, um, just to give you an idea of where where the data are coming from, which underlie uh, the things I'm talking about today. Um, so here we did. So here we did um, a study. So uh, we got a whole bunch of uh, people to volunteer. And I must say, when we started doing this research, I was worried that um, people uh, wouldn't volunteer. Like I, I think I wouldn't. Would I want a bunch of strangers like rummaging through my stuff and looking around? I thought I, I wouldn't really. But it turned out we asked people to volunteer, and people, as soon as they started to think about it, they are actually genuinely interested in what impressions people form of them. What, what, and I get this now all the time. People always think, come and look at my desk. What, you know, tell me what it says and all those things. But, but, um, and, and people are genuinely interested. And by the end of the study, we had people begging us to, to, to be in the study, to continue the study longer so that they could have their rooms evaluated. So what happened is, um, so this is one of the rooms, and, um, and we'd have to prepare them before. And the, the preparation led to sort of a good... A uh, deal of thinking about people's spaces. So the first thing we did, of course, was cover up people's names because it was anonymous. People participated in the study anonymously, um, and then we we um, s said, "Okay, well, what we're going to do with photographs? Because we know photographs. We know already that people form impressions of others on the basis of what they look like. So, so we didn't want to keep those photographs in there because we thought." People are going to. We won't then know if people are forming the impressions of the items in there, or of, of or on the basis of what people look like. So we thought, okay, let's just remove all the photos. But then, no, that that seems that doesn't seem right, because the photos you choose to have of yourself, I think, say really important things about deep elements of your identity, who you are. Which photos do you choose to display? As I said before, there are many you could have had. Right, of the many photos you could put up of yourself, which ones do you have? Do you have the photo of yourself? You know, meditating on top of a mountain in, in you know Northern California somewhere, or do you have a a photo of yourself, you know, drunkenly yelling at the camera with all of your friends during like a drunken night on the town? And and those things, right? It could be the same person, but many people have both. I don't know, many people have both. Photos, but you know, you could which photo you choose to display says something about the sense of self, of how you see yourself, and how you would like to project your personality to the world. Um. So, what did we do? Well, we wanted to leave the photos in there, but without letting, without, um, uh, without letting uh, people be able to see them. So we took a bunch of yellow post-its, and we would put them over the photos so you could see what was going on in the photo, but you, uh, you couldn't see what the person was like. And that, that led to a number of things. The first thing, of course, is that when you go into a room, it immediately indicated how many photos they had of themselves. Some photo room, rooms or offices you go into... There's nothing, right? Other ones you go into and the walls are plastered with yellow post-its because they just had hundreds and hundreds of photos of themselves, uh, you know, which is very reasonable. Um, and, but I think one of the things that it, um, uh, uh, it gave us, one of the things we found is that people are pretty good at judging how attractive occupants are just from going around their space. And we had kind of wondered how people were doing this. There was no direct photos of it. And I think what they're doing is they're using an implicit knowledge of mating patterns, right? We know from uh, evolutionary psychology that people tend to mate assortatively. That is, people tend to mate with people of similar attractiveness, more or less, right? They tend to be similar attractiveness. So I think what happened, and this is one of the ways they did it, I think there are other ways too, is what they do is they go into a space 
and they'd see a photo of Brad Pitt with his arm around a yellow post-it and they would think, okay, the, the clip pr presumably the person who you know this Brad Pitt look like is with is also attractive like that. So I think I think that's one of the ways they they they, they were um, uh, figuring it out. Okay, so we prepared the rooms and then I sent in my first team of judges. So this is my first team of judges, and they go in and they're filling out a uh, personality uh, ratings of what they think the person's like. Then they leave. And then I send a different team in. The different team is there, and they are cataloging all of the things in there. So they make general, general judge, judgments like, is it an inviting space? Is it colorful? Is it smelly? Is it dark? Is it um, organized? Is it cluttered? All those sorts of things. And then what they do is they, and then, uh, and then, then they also coded very narrow things like, so are there books there? How many books? What are the books on? What are the topics of the books? Have the books been used? Is there trash? Is the trash empty? Is there a clock? Is the clock fast? Is the clock slow? All, so they're going around and ca cataloging all these things so we can see what, um, so we can take a look at um, uh, um, uh, what the items are associated with certain judgments of people and also what the items are associated with what the different occupants are really like. So then they leave, but then we need to find out what the occupants are like themselves. So what do we do there? So we give the occupants um, um, uh, questionnaires. They take personality tests and we get, get their, their uh, re results back. Um, and, and so, but as you know, that, that may not be very good, right? Because uh, as I'm sure you know, maybe not you, but you know other people who are deluded about themselves, right? Many of us just don't really know what we're like. And, and so we also get the occupant's friends to fill out surveys about the occupants too, so we could get both sorts of information, right? And the idea is that, is that for some things, for some things, you are a better source of information. So if I want to know, right, it could, it could, be, the, it could be the case right now that half of you guys are worrying about money. Right? You could be worrying, and half of you may not be. But I would never know it, right? Because that would not be expressed. It's stuff that's going on inside your head. So when you're asking people things like, uh, for, for things that are really internal, things that are really involve your, your thinking, it's best to ask the, the, the person themselves to get a self-report. You can tell me, yeah, I worry about money a lot. No, I never think about it. But if I want to know about other things, other things that involve social interactions, and especially other things that involve sort of an evaluative element of social interaction, then it's best to ask other people. The classic example here, of course, is, is are you stingy, right? Is you, you don't think you're stingy, right? But all your friends who get stuck with, with paying, having to pay 50 cents more because you only had the iced tea, whereas they had like a ice cream or something like that at the end of the meal, those people say you're stingy, whereas you, of course, see it as perfectly reasonable behavior. Okay. So, what we did is we take those two different things and we, uh, and we combine those. So then we, then we could see uh, where, where we, uh, what people do. Okay, so here is some more of people. So then we videotape it and we, I just put the F we had the FBI come and talk to us. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But uh, I mainly put us up here because it's kind of flash to have something with, like the FBI associated with me. But, but they really aren't at all associated with us at all. Okay, and then we, uh, okay, so then here we, here's another study we did in people's office spaces. So here you see people coding, photographing, videotaping the different spaces. Um, obviously, this was like, you know, 100 years ago with a video camera like that. Um, uh, okay. Uh, and so here are some spaces. You've seen those ones before. What else was I going to show? Oh yeah, so, here, so here's a space. So, you know, people say, "Is the behavioral residue?" Yeah, here's here's one of the here's one of the uh, uh, forms of uh, uh, this was just one office space, and you can see there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. Lots of clues about what people are like, the things they put up on the walls, the screensavers, the music they're listening to, their uh, reading interests. You know, uh, other other uh, uh, icons here, and anyway, that sort of behavior at half filled glass, all kinds of things, so, so some kind of medication there or, or something. So there's lot, lots of evidence of things in these spaces uh, uh, for, for, for all forms of these expressions, identity claims, behavior, behavioral residue, and uh, self-regulators. Uh, um, okay, so what they did was they, um, 
Oh, here's, here's some, I like these spaces. Here, here are three different ones. One reason I like showing these spaces is it's, it's, cubicle, it's some cubicles which are essentially the same space, right? It's essentially the same space, but you can see that these people have done very different things with them, and they really sort of uh, reflect different behaviors and project different types of personalities in terms, in terms of what's going on in these places. Okay, so what did I, so we, so just, uh, we used what's known as, in, in my field, as the, uh, uh, the Big Five framework, or the, you can see it as the Ocean Model, O-C-E-A-N. And, um, and so this is what people were trying to uh, figure out about people. Uh, this is what we were looking at. But we were looking at some other traits, too, which I'll tell you, t uh, other types of uh, personality elements, which I'll tell you about in a moment. So just, just, just to give you an idea, um, we're looking at uh, openness, which I, I see as I call sort of the Leonardo factor, right? So, so these are people who are who are uh, intellectual, they're broad-minded, they like to try new stuff. How would you recognize these people? These people are the people they go to, and you find them in the poetry section of a bookstore. If they go to a restaurant, they look at the menu, and they say, I've never seen that item before, I'll have that one, right? Whereas people low on the trait, which... Uh, they, they, they're much more traditional, conventional. They say, do you have spaghetti? I know I like spaghetti. I like what I know. I know what I like. Give me the spaghetti wherever they go, right? Which is, again, a very reasonable thing to do, but it's just, it reflects a different outlook on the world. So those are people, high versus low. The next, conscientiousness is a really uh, bad, uh, a bad uh, label for it, but I try and think of this as, as the Robocop factor. These are people who are rule-oriented. They are... They are not impulsive. This is really, this is what you want the people sitting in the air traffic control tower to have, be really, really high on, okay? These people come to work on time. They pay attention. They don't goof off. They're not impulsive. They pay attention to details. They're, they're time-oriented. So really think of it as the air traffic controller factor is one way of thinking about it. These people keep their pencil sharp. They have spare supplies. They, if, if you look at their offices, they... They, you know, they have the, they have the, they know where the stapler is because the stapler is right next to the sticky tape dispenser, and the sticky tape dispenser has spare rolls of sticky tape waiting to be used, um, and they have a place for the uh, paper clips, uh, and, and the and the paper clips are in that place for the paper clips, and so on. Uh, extroversion is kind of like, you know, this this is the obvious one. This is the uh, uh, you know Beverly Hills Cop factor. Um, a lot of 80s movies in this. Uh, uh, so they, so this is people outgoing. Extra, you know, these are the people you want at a party. Extroverts are such an interesting group, and, and there's a lot. The evidence of extroversion shows up in a lot of the domains. They just like people, and they 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 try to get people to come and speak to them. They, they where, whatever they do, wherever they are, they 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 really like. Uh, encourage social interactions. We see, we see evidence for this in a number of domains, in the photos people put up. We see it in, in their office spaces. Extroverts have very inviting spaces, so they're trying to lure people into their offices. Right? They have their doors open. They have like a bowl of candy on the thing. They have a comfortable place to sit. They're, you know, they're sort of constantly looking up as people come, but they really want to get you in. They just like being with people, whereas introverts, they absolutely don't. If you go in the doors much further closed, you go in, it's a kind of uncomfortable chair. You don't feel very welcome. The, the introverts just prefer not to be around people. Again, very, all of these things, I'm not being evaluated about any of these, but they're just different, out, different ways of, of expressing oneself. Uh, the agreeableness, actually, uh, uh, yeah, Mother Teresa, actually, I was told Mother Teresa is actually, was actually very mean, somebody told me recently, so I, I think of this as the, the, uh, the Mr. Rogers factor is maybe a better way of thinking about it. These are people just nice people, they're kind, sympathetic, warm, they're, versus people who are more critical, direct, uh, uh, rude, uh, you know, they don't spare your feelings. And then the uh, last factor, of course, is, is neurotism, that would, as epitomized by uh, uh, Woody Allen. So, th th you know, the, these people are anxious, they worry more, they're easily stressed. And this, uh, from the other end of the domain, is, you, know, you might think of the dude from The Big Lebowski, who is, uh, who's, who's at the other end of this scale, who doesn't, you know, he doesn't get ruffled even when nihilists uh, urinate on his carpet or whatever it is they do. <laughs> Um, okay, so, so these are the domains. So um, I don't know wh which, which, which of these do you guys think you could pick up from somebody, say, uh, living space. So who thinks uh, you could, uh, openness would be the one you'd be most likely to pick up on in a living space? A few people, okay. What about, what about conscientiousness? Who thinks that's the one that would show up most clearly? Okay. Okay, but hold on, before we go any further, who is not going to put their hand up when I ask these questions? <laughs> okay. The, the disagreeable people, okay. That, that, that is, okay, eight people. Okay, uh, okay, so everybody else, 
Okay, so we have uh, open extroversion. Who thinks you can pick that up in people's living space? Okay. Agreeableness. Two. That. Okay. Neuroticism. Okay. Well, this, okay. Well, clearly some of these people who oh who cares? I'm not even going to get into that. You're welcome not to put your hand up if you don't want to. Okay. Uh, so uh, so what so what this suggests though is that, it, though, that I would say probably most people thought that conscientiousness would show up in living spaces, but what I always get is a lot of is a lot of variation in, in, in the predictions people have. And indeed, when, when I started doing this research, uh, conscientiousness, that's the one that I thought would show up most clearly in people's spaces. You can imagine how it would. People have the very organized spaces. They have spare supplies. Things are neat and tidy. The handwriting's neat and tidy. The books are alphabetized, all these sorts of things. And indeed, that's true. Indeed, in, indeed that's true. People with those features in their, in their physical space are indeed higher on uh, this factor than others. However, people who, are, who, um, who have those features, who have these very organized, uncluttered, tidy places where everything's alphabetized and organized and so on, people who have those are also judged to be uh, high on this factor, the agreeableness factor. They're, agree they're judged to be nicer. So if people go into their, space, uh, into their space and see that, they judge them to be nicer. But it turns out that's not true. It turns out they're not nicer. It turns out that people are incorrectly using cues that are valid indicators for this dimension to judge this one as well. Okay? And that's an important thing to know, is that people won't just judge you uh, on this factor on the basis of your neatness. They'll also judge this. However, even stronger than all these, the fact that the, the dimension that comes most clearly through in people's living spaces, this factor is the openness to experience factor. That's the one that really is, is, is most clearly detected. People can pick this up very, very well. How do they do it? In living spaces, they do it using, uh, it's hard to come up with a specific reason because they, it's the, the biggest clue is places that are distinctive. Things that are just unusual. So uh, we looked at, in fact, we, we went past, uh, you may, may or may not have seen it. So one of the rooms that was, had one of the, uh, the occupants who was highest in openness for it had a bedside lamp made out of a bottle of vodka and packets of Prozac around the side. And it was full of Prozac pills on the, on, on the uh, inside. Okay? So this was a very unusual, unconventional thing. So it's very hard to come up with a specific set of items that you'll find in people's spaces. Instead, it's, it's, it's a much broader category. It's like, do they have a bed made out of a canoe? Do they have, I don't know, do they have a stuffed piranha hanging from the ceiling? What, just things that just are unusual. These people tend to be um, uh, high on this um, uh, openness factor. Now, the other thing is you can learn, though, these, so these are personality traits, but they're really quite a superficial way of understanding what people are like, right? This might be good. If you, want, if you wanted to... Um, if you wanted to decide who's going to get a certain job or, or be assigned to a certain job, then it would be useful, right? If you wanted to say, okay, I want to know somebody who's conscientious and somebody's open, that's a kind of useful thing to say, who should be in charge of the accounts or something like that. That would be useful things to know. But it wouldn't really be useful if you wanted to know... Um, if you, that wouldn't be enough. If you want to know more than that before marrying someone, right? Before marrying somebody, you want to go a bit deeper than this, right? You want to know about deeper things, things like what do people value? What are their goals? What are their roles? And ultimately, you want to know how people see themselves. How do they see themselves? And this is why I think, um, this is why I think uh, um, uh, places like... Um, uh, living spaces are so important because they contain lots of clues to people's identity, the sorts of symbols that they relate to, the photos they put up of themselves, the, the, the art they put on the walls, and so on. So I think the, the, so that's why one of the reasons why looking at somebody's living spaces is, is really helps you get an idea of what somebody's like. Okay, so what I wanted to um, uh, turn to now is um, uh, a few just tips. Is that a, is that a question? Oh. It's sort of a basic approach question. I'm wondering whether, I mean, there's sort of three dimensions that you talked about. There's how people see themselves, yes. how others see them, and who they really are. And something you identified there is interesting, you know, that the conscientiousness yeah. comes across as agreeableness, but when you're really, you've got Leona Helmsley or Martha Stewart yeah. um, personality. Are you focused on how people respond, how, in other words, even if inaccurately? I think, well, I think for, for different, different, different things, different, things, different, for different tasks, different levels of that are, are important. So if I am choosing somebody to be in charge of the accounts, what's really important is how they behave, right? How, how they 
you might say, really are. Right? Now, they may not see themselves that way, right? It's quite possible that somebody, and in fact, you do see this, and, you know, especially, and especially with this trait, is people, I mean, we've all had this, we've all had this experience, right, where somebody says, uh, you know, you're going to go into somebody's house and they go, don't come in. Oh, don't come in. It's a terrible mess. My place is a terrible mess. And they're not, they're not, it's not an act. They kind of believe. They feel it's a terrible mess. They really do. And what they mean, or of course by the terrible mess, is that one of the coasters on the corner of the table was out of alignment, right? And from their point of view, though, it was a terrible mess, you know. And, and so, for some things, when you want to know how they, we want to know they behave, how they really are, but for other things, if you really want to know that person, even though that person thinks they're a terrible slob, they, they themselves, they, oh, I'm a terrible slob, look, look, look at this. What, for, for, in order to get to know them, so if you wanted to know them, say, as somebody, as a potential you know, dating partner or something like that, what would be important is to know how they see themselves. So for different, for different tasks, these different, different views, are, views are important. Other things also is, is to know is how are they viewed by their friends, right? I mean, some, 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 some of our traits are defined by how others see us, right? Like the idea of, you know, that somebody is irritating or something like that, right? That is defined by the, the effects of, on others, you know. Um, so, so, again, it depends on the task as to which one of those things we'd want, we, we, would, we would want to look at. Um, Okay, so what I'm going to do is, is just talk about some of these sort of uh, some snooping tips just, just for uh, uh, the hell of it. Uh, so, okay, so one of the, one of the widest mistakes, the uh, uh, most common mistakes people make when they start snooping is, they, is, they, is they're trying to go too far. They're trying to make assumptions on the basis of a single clue, and you just can't do that. So often I'll get a question where somebody says, hey, I have a uh, blue wooden chicken on top of my television. What does that mean? <laughs> All right, and the answer is, I have no idea what it means. I have absolutely no idea what a blue wooden chicken on top of the television means because it could be there for many different reasons. It could, you could, there are a number of different reasons. I mean, not an infinite number, but there are a number of different reasons why you might have a blue wooden chicken on the top of the television. And it could be because you, it's a gift for somebody. You're going to do it. It could be very important to you. Perhaps it really says, reminds you of an important moment. Perhaps you're a, a, a chicken aficionado. It, there are a number of different reasons. So... One of, the bi- the, one of the biggest um, uh, re- things that we do is, is, is to not interpret uh, clues in isolation. When you're looking at a, um, when you're going through, we're looking for broad themes. We're looking for themes, um, uh, and I, I have Sherlock Holmes there, but really the, 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 the uh, figure I use in my book is Hercule Poirot, saying really you're building up a case and so, because each piece of ev- evidence that we know about from snooping research, any one piece of evidence is not conclusive evidence. It just says that somebody tends to, people who do this tend to be this way. So you're building it up. So you meet somebody and they give you a firm handshake. You say, okay, well, I know from the handshake research what that means. That means the, they tend to be higher on extroversion, tend to be lower on neuroticism. And if they're females, they tend to be lower, uh, higher on openness. So you say, I know that, but it's not a conclusive case. So that will direct me. Now let's look at the music. Is that consistent with the music? I'm interested in in uh, uh, extroversion level, so we, I know that music is a good place to look for that. So it, it, can, it can direct you to these different tasks. You're building up a case. Um, and this, this, this relates to the second, the second uh, tip for snooping, and that is to be very, very wary of distinctive information. Distinctive information, the very thing that makes it distinctive is the thing that means you should be very wary about interpreting. Let me give you an example from our research. So in one of our studies, we went into a bedroom of a female in her 20s, um, and it, everything in the room said she was a socially responsible, wholesome person. Okay, so it was neat and tidy. There was um, evidence of doing good activities. There was the calendars. The calendars were nicely filled out. There was sort of evidence of attending all kinds of uh, uh, wholesome, wholesome um, gr- groups and doing things like that. Uh, the music was sort of very gentle, a lot of Natalie Merchant in there, all, all those sorts of things going on. And so you go, except, and then over in the corner of the room, there was a plastic crate. And in that plastic crate was a whole set of drugs paraphernalia, and would, including like a bong for marijuana and all kinds of stuff in there, okay? And of course, this stuck out. So our judges come into the room, and they, and they look around, boring, boring, oh, look at the crate. They go over to the crate and spend hours poring over the crate and ignoring everything else. Now, that crate stuck out 
in a way that it wouldn't stick out in, uh, in somebody who was, who was less wholesome and more of a rebel, more counterculture, where, where they had you know, a, a more, more of a sort of reckless person space. It wouldn't stick out so much there. But it stuck out in this space, and it stuck out because it was inconsistent. But because it was inconsistent, that's why they should have ignored it, because it, was, it, it su suggested this is not part of this person's overall pattern. And indeed, when I asked the, um, the occupant later on, I said, what was that plastic crate doing in your case? She said, oh, well, my, my roommate was going to go traveling around the world for a year, and she asked me to look after her drugs paraphernalia, so I put it all in a crate and put it over in the corner of the room. So, she w so it did, in, in fact, reflect her wholesome, friendly, kind behavior of looking after her friend's drug stuff, but it didn't reflect her drug-taking behavior. So you, but it's very easy to misinterpret that thing. So, so be very, very careful about interpreting the, um, uh, the, uh, um, the, 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 the stuff that's very distinctive. Um, I've already talked a little bit about location. So th here's some cases. So this is one uh, I went around for a television studios, offices, and here are you know, different sets of photos. This is what I was talking about earlier about the location. You see the photos on the right. right Now those, as you, I'll show you the broader picture of the office in a moment. These are the baby pictures which are all down there, and you'll see they're just off the side of the monitor. So these are the social snacks. Whereas here, these ones are on the window ledge behind where the person sits, right? So you come into the office and you see him framed by all the, all the you know, his beautiful, you know, progeny. Okay, and so there, there you see, so this is where the photos, the social snacks were on the computer screens right here, so they can just look up, whereas these ones are behind framing, frame, frame, framing the guy. So again, location is very important. There's a particularly, um, one, of my, um, one of my colleagues, there's an example of the location, one of my colleagues, um, he has a, a, somebody who was a mentor of his, an, an academic mentor, and he was particularly fond and admired this person, uh, but... He, ha he, took, he took the social snack, and you could tell it was a social snack by how he organized it. He, but it was too much for him to have it... <coughs> excuse me. It was too much for him to have it framed in, in front of him. That would have been overwhelming to have this photo. So what he did was he took this picture of Ned. It was a, it was a, you know, a, a famous psychologist, but who he felt very friendly. At. He took the fo this, this picture of Ned and put it on the inside of one of his cupboards in the office. And it was at the inside door, and I, saw, and I only know because I saw him doing this one day. He was working, and then just before we went out, he, 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 took, he opened the cupboard and took a little look. So it was, like a little, it was just like a little dose of Ned, and then closed it and could leave like that. And so you, you could tell that it, that's the function it was serving by, um, by its location and, 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 uh, and uh, how it was used. Um, what else was I going to talk about? Oh, yeah. So the other thing I was going to talk about, it's, it's all very well to say when, you, when you're snooping around um, that, uh, that uh, you know, isn't it fun? What can you learn about somebody whose space you've never been in? You know, and that's kind of a fun thing to do. But it's not very realistic, right? It's not actually very realistic that you're in someone's space who you've never even seen or never even met. What's far more realistic is there someone you kind of know. You're just getting to know, and they invite you back to their office, or they invite you back to their living space, and you say, oh, what more can I learn about them? That's what's much more realistic. And that's where sort of understanding these ideas of snooping, looking at location, state, and so on, can really guide your search for information. And sometimes it's quite a basic search. It's asking someone, but knowing what questions to ask. My friend Lisa, who, when I first met her, I didn't know her very well. And, uh, okay. I, <laughs> when I first met her, she invited me back to her house um, for a cup of tea. And we have a cup of tea, and I excuse myself and go to the bathroom. But uh, on the way to the bathroom, I go through the bedroom. And when I'm in the bedroom, I notice this bookshelf, this bookcase. And on the top of the bookcase, there is, the, it's an ordinary bookcase, but on the top, there's a little raised area, and Hemingway's movable feast is sitting there, and it's facing out, and it's clearly been placed very carefully. It's a little, it was a little sort of Hemingway shrine. Now, I didn't know what the Hemingway novel meant, but I could tell from its placement that it was important, that it was really central to Lisa's identity. So that led me to ask questions, led me to ask Lisa about that, and she, she then told me about this theme, about how it was important to her because of the period it was written about when Hemingway wasn't famous and so on. And then that began to gel with other things that I knew about her. For example, the, the quotes she had at the bottom of her emails, you know, the signature files where you have quotes. They, it, was, it was consistent with that. So it led me to ask questions and, and, uh, about things that I never would have guessed otherwise. Um, 
So anyway, so, th so that's another thing, uh, Snoopy. And then the other thing I just want to warn you is if you start snooping around people's places and then you go up to them and say, okay, this is what I think about you, am I right? <laughs> They'll often say, no, wrong. And that happened to me. And the, th the point is that people don't have very good insight. And I, I hinted at this point earlier. So my friend Lois, um, I went around her office. She was in a, in a different, different department but at the university. I went around her office, and it was just in the classic air traffic controller's office. And I came out and said, well, I think based on this, what I think is, you know, I think you plan and you think ahead. Um, you, you know, you have spare supplies. You, uh, you, know, you, sh you know, you're a very punctual person. You show up for time for classes. And she goes, aha, no, you're wrong. Yeah, you got that wrong, didn't you? Recently, she said, I've actually, I've actually been showing up really late for my classes. I thought, that, that's a bit odd. Uh, okay, how, and she, so can you, what do you mean? She goes, well, actually, for the, for the past few weeks, I've, only been I've been showing up for my classes only 15 minutes before they start. Now, now for her, this was the end. This, the chaos, wa chaos was about to be unleashed on the streets because she was only showing up 15 minutes before her classes started. You know, whereas I, I have never shown up 15 minutes before my class. <laughs> First of all, it seems like a waste of time, and, I, and even if I wanted to, I couldn't, I just couldn't, I don't have it in me to get my act together to do that. I just, just, I, I couldn't do that. And so it, it shows you that you have to be very, very careful when, when because, because part of having a certain personality which affects your space also affects how you see the world. We all know people, somebody who's very, very anxious, they just see, they perceive a world full of threats. The world is just a threatening place. So if you're with somebody anxious, you know, and, and like a, a door slams down, the, they, what, what was that? Whereas if somebody who's laid back, they, they don't even notice it, it, it's happening. You just see a different world, and that can, perceive, uh, that, that can affect how you respond to these sorts of things. Um, okay, now I don't know what to talk about. So should I stop and take questions, or should I talk about uh, some architecture stuff? I'm, I can go either way. Who's in charge here? <laughs> you. Uh, really? Oh, maybe you guys. What do you think? Okay, I'm going to talk just very briefly about this stuff that, um, that um, uh, 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 some work that has been done applying this stuff. So if you think what, what I've been talking about is I've been talking about the spaces that you and I, we all have these spaces and we take a sort of standard space and we try and mold it, right? We try and select motifs and colors we like and put it up and we try and take a, sp a standard space and fit ourselves into it. Uh, work by uh, Chris Travis, who runs this architecture firm. There is Chris sitting. Uh, I don't know if that's really what he looks like. Or if it, oh, no, it looks fine here. It just it looks very narrow on my screen. Uh, so there he is, um, Chris Travis. So he, he runs this um, architecture um, firm where he really incorporates psychology from the very, very beginning. Before he's even begun with the plans, he goes into this very, very deep, um, psychological interviews, these extensive psychological interviews which ask you about your relationships, they ask you about your childhood, a very extensive section of that, on um, special objects and so on. And then he uses this, this understanding of, um, of the sort of the psychological, what space means to you, what objects mean to you. And sometimes there, in many cases, they, they can be very frightening things. The, the one of his clients, um, uh, you know, uh, was abused as a child in, a, in, in, you know, in, in a dark space, and so he couldn't have any dark spaces within that space, although she wasn't consciously aware that that early experience was affecting her preference for certain architectural styles. And so, and, and his houses are very different. It's not, and one thing that's interesting, this is one of the houses he's valued. It looks like a kind of ordinary house, but this really picks up, I mean, I'm not going to go into detail on this one, I'll go into another one. Oh, this is a, a people who really enjoyed uh, uh, wandering the narrow streets of Italy. That's their sort of f happy memories. And, and so he's built a kind of like, it, there's a kind of, it's like a street. It's sort of, it's, it's like a street area which goes all the way along here. But the bedrooms sort of open up onto it as though you're in a narrow street, street in one of these Tuscan towns. And there's all kinds of other things going on in this space which just look like a nice house. Now, all the houses are very, very different. It's not as though he has hit on the one thing that, that, that works. They're all very, very different. Um, so I just wanted to talk briefly about this next one. So this is by one, a guy who, does, who and, and Travis says this is quite important, especially in guys who says, I'm a view guy. I like views, okay? And that's, and, and that's how it's experienced, this experience of I like views. But what Travis has learned through doing this, and so he has this, he's built a, 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 a three-story lighthouse kind of on top of his house with views all the way around. But what people really mean, Travis has learned, is when they say they're a view guy, what they mean 
is they want to survey their dominion. They want to see, look what I have accomplished and acquired, right? And it's really, it's really showing off. It's showing off to their friends, look at all I have, look at, look at what I have done, and, you know, which is a very reasonable thing to do to others, of course, which often, in the case of these men, serves as some kind of proxy for some father figure, saying, look, I've succeeded, I've done all right. And so this, so this, this, this is this one guy. But of course, you ask them, the people don't experience it that way. The experience, the psychological experience is, I like views. Now, one of the interesting things is, is, is he designs these houses for people, and with only one exception, on the first design, after these long interviews, the interviews takes a long time, he designs these house, houses for people, with one exception, he shows them the design, and they say, that's it. And they go with the first design, which I don't know how many of you have ha been through architectural processes. That's very rare. Most of the time in architecture, it's taken up with redesigns. You, they, the, architect, the architect who's taught there, an artist, right? Don't tell me what to do. I'm the artist. Here is my piece. Do you like it? You don't like it. All right, well, I'll, and then they go and redesign it and try and, and, try and do some more, right? But there's not in, they're not integrating these sort of psychological um, meanings uh, uh, at the very early stage. But one of the interesting things is, although nearly, almost without exception, having gone through this process, people arrive at a space they adore. They, everyone I spoke to said, we love this place. Even so, they, then I say, okay, well, um, tell me, tell me how, you know, I was interested, tell me, tell me how the, uh, the interview and the psychological analysis played into the design of your place. And they go, oh, that didn't have anything to do with it. It played no role at all. So it's amazing. Travis had told me that people had no uh, would not recognize that it had anything to do with it, um, but they, um, but they, uh, 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 but I didn't believe it until I saw it. So here was a case where, so he takes important objects. So this was, this was a, a widow whose husband was a doctor, and he, he used to use this old um, uh, 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 a gurney, it was an old gurney, which he used to keep his paint cans on, and they converted it to a chopping board in the middle of the kitchen. And, I, and so we were looking around the kitchen here, and Travis was said, oh yes, of course, it was really important for us to have this gurney, because it was a connection to both her, her, you know, her former spouse and his profession, and the fact that he used it all the time. So we, used, you know, we had put this in the central of the kitchen. She goes, what? Oh, that thing, that had nothing to do with it. And then I just saw her, she, her face, and she nearly burst into tears, and then just pushed it away and carried on. You know, but she was unwilling to acknowledge the role that it played, uh, or, and, but although it clearly contributed to how she felt about it. Now, when I was driving home, I must say, one of the things that Travis has learned is that when we create spaces as adults, when we have the social and financial ability to create a space we want, he said it's amazing how often that what we're doing is we're trying to recreate a grandparent's home, the feeling we had as a, as a child running around going to a grandparent's home because so often these spaces are places we go, we, your parents take you to these places and, it, and you can be safe and fun and the grandparents can spoil you and it's just sort of a wonderfully relaxed place. And he said it's, it's amazing how often there's some kind of echo of a grandparent's place feeling in this in, in the space that he designs. And I remember driving home from looking at all these homes in, a, in my sort of very superior way, thinking, oh, isn't it sweet how, how all those people are affected by their grandparents' homes, oh, you know, how weak-minded they are, and so on. And then I get home to my own house, and I open my refrigerator, and then I, I had this, this, this uh, flash of realizing, I've done this myself. Oh, my God, I've done this myself. Now, my refrigerator is kind of unusual. Uh, I think, uh, oh, God, I was going to show you that, I'll show you that. There is my refrigerator. <laughs> and that really is it. That is what my refrigerator looks like every day. So it's not, this is not set up for the photo. Just before coming, I went a little bit. And you can see, it's kind of like an OCD refrigerator. Now, you may have guessed that I'm not generally OCD. And it stays this way. So if somebody says, so, oh, yeah, have a, have, have a tab. Fine, here you go. And they turn their back, and while I'm looking, I quickly replace it and put another one there. <laughs> and, and, and this is not my normal thing. And, so, and, I, and I've often wondered... Why, why is my refrigerator like this? I'm not like this in my other domains. What's going on? And then after talking to, after talking to Travis, oh, look, I'll show you. See, look, there is my, there's my desk on a really good day. That's about as good as it ever gets. And uh, there's my refrigerator. Okay. Uh, so, 
So I wonder, and then I had these flashbacks to my playing with my brother at my grandparents' house. When we were a little kid, we'd go to my grandparents' house, and there'd be the living room, and, and, and then the, and it opened up onto the garden. We could go and play, go play in the garden, go have fun, and if you ever get thirsty, just come inside and go to the drinks cabinet and help yourself to tonic water. Like, how many can we have? As many as you like. As many as we like. Like, it was unlimited tonic water. It just, it just seemed like amazing to have this sort of, this amazing uh, idea of abundance. You know, for us, there could be nothing more than as many tonic water bottles as we like. And, and so to me, it really represented this feeling of plenty and happy and you know, the world would never end and it all be wonderful. And so then I suddenly realized that what I have, what I have done here is I have recreated my, uh, my, my grandmother's drinks cabinet, essentially, with this idea that it, it, it will never end and the world is good and, 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 and happiness. Um, okay, so that was it. And then, I'll, uh, yeah... Uh, we're running out of time. So I'm going to stop there. If anyone, if we have time for questions, I'll take a couple of questions. We do. We do. Yeah, we can hand up now. Oh, we do. Oh, we have lots of time. Okay. I thought. Don't you guys have to rush off somewhere? No. <laughs> you don't. You don't have work to be doing. <laughs> Damn. Okay. Oh well. Then, then I'll just show you these plans because these are interesting. So I was talking about um, uh, Travis being a slightly different type of um, a slightly different type of architect, right? So where most architects will draw a plan. And what they will have is they will have in their plan, it says something like, you know, master bedroom, hallway, or something like that. What he does is he, his plans are marked with the psychological, the psychological uh, environment they're trying to create. So, so it says what he is trying to create. And he also uses these. Um, and so, in, um, so here are a couple of, for example, plans. I'll show you a couple of these plans. So here, you see, this is one, uh, this is one master sleeping area. It says tranquility heaven is what this says. Okay? Over here, rejuvenation of spirit. You know, and things like that. Uh, bar, master bath, par, uh, private and personal. But here, so here's one thing. But they're not, but not everybody, there's not everyone's association with a master bedroom is tranquility heaven. So it, this is another one of his designs. And here, the master bedroom, it says, privacy, passion, reflection. Okay? So he's, so through this process, he starts off with the psychological um, feeling he is trying to create and then builds a place for that. How does he do He does all kinds of things. It's really interesting. Talking to him about how he works with couples. He says, so often, many of the issues in a relationship, either the things that are going wrong in a relationship or the things that are failing to kind of be nurtured, have architectural solution. He has a whole exercise called it remodeling your mate. It's much easier to change your house than it is to change your mate or change your mate's behavior even. And so he has a whole section both on, on how you can avoid the things that go wrong in relation, many of the things, that, the sort of annoyances that go wrong. You know, what, you know, why is he always in my kitchen under my feet? And they're just silly little things like that. But also in terms of nurturing relationships. So, for example, one of the couples he talked about, they said, well, you know, he said, what are the rituals you perform? What are the sort of daily rituals you perform to help? He said, well, we, you know, go into the... We go into the kitchen to have a coffee together, but it's kind of crazy by then. We're so busy with kids around. So, so what he did for their design is he created a house which, where he knew this was an important uh, ritual for them, which had a little coffee bar inside, a little coffee bar inside the bedroom. There's a coffee bar inside the bedroom. So before they have gone out, so they get up in the morning, this couple who are incredibly busy, before they've gone out of the bedroom and facing kids and life and all those sorts of things, they can have a little coffee together, they make a coffee, and there's a little porch. And the little porch, so they can go out there and just sort of look out in, in, into their yard. And that decision has huge design implications, because where you want the porch facing affects the whole way you orient the whole house. The whole orientation of the house is, is affected by that. And so he, he, he's able to use the architecture to sort of like build in these, um, uh, these psychological principles of what we are trying to do with our space. Um, Okay, now I'm going to stop and I'll take some questions. Thanks. Sorry about that. Oh, stop. Yes? Have you gone back and looked at the Facebook pages of any of these subjects, and is there any correlation between the way they present themselves to the world? That's a great question. The question was, have we looked at Facebook pages? In fact, we've done a lot of work. 
Sorry? Or MySpace. Yeah, we've done a lot of work. Actually, we have done quite a lot of work with Facebook. I didn't talk about it today, but we've done quite a lot of work with people's Facebook pages. And the question we had is, what are people doing with their Facebook pages? And, you know, and I think there are a number of different answers to it. At least our research suggests there is. The first question is, they're doing a lot of different things. Some people are using it to project themselves. Some people are using it as a means of social, social interaction and so on. What we really thought was going on was we wondered whether, well, are people just trying to create an ideal self? Are they trying to promote themselves as an ideal self? Is it a sort of like an, av an area to advertise themselves? Or is it more like just a mode of interaction, like the telephone? And at least in the samples we were using, who were, who were nearly all students, what is really just, our, our, our analysis suggests it's just another means of interacting. And, and the how we found that is we asked these people, we got, how do you really see yourself? And we are, got, actually got a whole bunch of information from others how they've seen, and how would you like to be? And then we got people, other people say, to just look at their Facebook profiles and judge them on the basis of their Facebook profiles. And the judgments corresponded far more strongly with how they really saw themselves than how they would like to be. What was another really interesting finding from this research, though, was that people have no idea how they're viewed. We said, how do you think you're viewed on the basis of your Facebook profile? And with the exception of their extroversion, they were pretty clueless about how people were viewing them. But again, it's, there's lots of things that are going on there, right? It's, it's an opportunity to uh, project herself, but also to interact. And, you know, and, you know I, think so, and I think Facebook is, and MySpace and all that stuff is so rich because there's so much going on. It looks trivial, right? Are people, I mean, if you look at people's wall posts, right, you know, when they're having these conversations on the walls, and then you think, and you just need to look at those, right, to realize people aren't trying to create a good impression. Hey, how you doing? Fine. How you doing? What's going on? Not much. How are you doing? All right. You know, like, I mean, this, those are not the interactions you would post on your wall if you wanted to create a good impression, right? It's just, you know, frivolous at best. Uh, yes, person in red. When you look at the objects in someone's space, do you look at whether or not that object <coughs> would be a naturally occurring item in that space to determine whether or not it's, yeah. uh, you know, when you look at the openness factor? Yeah. So, like, if I have a stapler in my office, it makes sense. But yeah. if I have a stapler in the bathroom. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And 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 sometimes you need to look at the at the local environment. So recently, I was asked to go around uh, the Newsweek offices. So I went around a whole bunch of Newsweek offices, and and they wanted me to actually just compare two of them. They said, "Okay, take a look at these offices." And I, and 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 this is something I recommend you do before you go through do any snooping. Is you have to assess the local conditions and go and think what are the norms. So um, I went. Um, to, uh, so I go in and see what's normal. Because if you go in and you say, okay, there's a completely empty wall, you don't know. Is that, is that person failed to decorate it or is it company policy not to do it? So you have to assess the local condition. And, you, and that's exactly what I mean, your question, your question of not interpreting isolated cues. A stapler in a bathroom has a completely different meaning to a stapler sitting, sit, uh, sitting on a desktop. Uh, you know, we saw yesterday, yesterday I was going, was, you have a, some local TV show, was it uh, something afternoon? Northwest afternoon, yeah. So I was going through, through their offices, and I go through the first office, and somebody has a little red plastic ducky sitting on there. I think, oh, that's interesting. And then I go to the next office, and they have the same ducky. And then the same, so it's obviously some freebie that they've all got. And so I learned, okay, that doesn't mean so much as it might otherwise mean if they, this person had brought it in, you know. Any other questions? Yes, person in green. So only make sure that the observer knows about the ex uh, his, his or her own background. Like, for example, when a people was raised like uh, with a, uh, with supply of beverages or let's say uh, tons of pictures on the walls, yeah. and there is an op is a bedroom with tons of pictures, yeah. it's quite normal. But it might not be the case if you come from a different culture, yeah. either in your home or a different country. Yeah, I think that, that, I think I think there, there that you touch on a number of important points there. The first is, you know, how would these these things be played out? They may be played out very differently in different cultures or from different backgrounds, and and uh, I think that's true. I think, well, first of all, so many of these processes, especially the identity claims, will, sh will show out more in cultures where it's important to express oneself. In some places, that's less important. But I, and I think the specific items may change across uh, culture to culture or things like that. But I think the general processes remain the same in terms of letting others. And so you might apply that to a local context. But it's also important to have an expert in in the domain you're in. So I, I don't know, I mean, I don't, 
have, I don't have a television, so I don't know anything really about what goes on on TV. And so if I need to go to, you know, teenagers' rooms, I need to, I need to go with an expert who can tell me the significance of, these, of the different things. If I go to a female's room, I go in, right, a female goes in and she says, oh, look at that, it's, it's Mac makeup, it's not cover girl, how significant, you know, like that. Whereas I look and I see, I see makeup, you know, uh, there's makeup over there, you know, so I think within that it's very important. Yes? Have you perform, uh, performed any of these studies in cultures that are either less Western influenced or non Western at all? No, I haven't. So, so all, all of my research has been done in this country, you know, and so that's certainly a limitation of that. But in terms of the ways I think is, 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 is some of the processes may be played out less strongly, but I think some of them are played out, but just using a different, a different uh, um, a currency, you know. Yes, person over there with the yellow thing around your hand. <laughs> I was hoping to hear a bit more about snooping in like music collections. Yeah. What, do you, what do you find and how do you do that? Yeah, I think snooping uh, music collections, and we've done quite a lot of research about looking at people's music collections, and, 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 and it makes a, a good deal of sense. I mean, when we, when we started doing the research, we, we, played a, uh, we had a subject playing getting to know you questions, like, uh, but getting to know you exercise, where over six weeks they could just, their job was to get to know each other well. And but they uh, weren't ever allowed to meet. They just sort of typed, typed uh, to each other, chatted uh, uh, to each other. And we found that music was the most common, it's more common than any other single topic that people use. So people have an intuitive sense that music's important. And we have found that it is, um, uh, that it is indeed important. And it's important in a number of different ways. First of all, in terms of the specific genres people listen to, that's, that's really uh, 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 crucial. So we know that different personalities tend to prefer different genres. Of course, these are generalizations. But, the, but there's other things you can learn, too, about them. You can learn, um, uh, you can learn about uh, the organization of the music collection. You go and look at somebody's CD collection or something like that. How organized is it? My, mine it, it, I'm not going to talk about my, the, 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 there's, see, you, know, you can see how organized it is, but you can look at the general themes, too. Is it, energet is it uplifting music? Is there vocal music? So just general themes across that, too, are also diagnostic of personality traits. And another thing worth saying here is that, is that here is a case where one might use stereotypes. You might use stereotypes to make um, inferences about, like, the typical the typical country music lover, the typical classical music lover, and so on. And so we've done quite a lot of work looking at the extent to which these stereotypes are valid. And we found that some stereotypes are valid. So for example, generally, the stereotypes about country music listeners and classical music listeners, those sorts of things, the rock music listeners, those are generally valid. Other genres, like dance music, like hip hop, and so on, those what the stereotypes about music listeners, those are, are less valid. So again, you need to know when, when to use stereotypes are often useful, but, you, but often they'll be misleading too. Yes? Do you have any thoughts about people who project a dislike for music altogether? That's my first question. And the other one is, do you, have you made any observations about the contrasting sizes of residential homes in this area? As far <laughs> as like there's lots of people with really big homes, yeah. and then there are lots that are any thoughts about people's preference for sizes of space and what that says about people? I, well, I think it doesn't, but again, it's a, it's a case where you need to look at the local, local environment. So, you know, having a, uh, a small house in the middle of Manhattan means something very different from having a, a small place in the middle of West Texas, you know, because where you have, you may have the same choice and like that. So again, you need to look at the, the thing. But yeah, I think it certainly does. People, I mean, it, it reflects, as in many of these things, any, so even the, even the size of house, right, is a potential reflection of many different things. It could just be the upbringing, right? So you'd need to do snooping to see if, if it was that. It could be, hey, look, I want to show all I have accomplished. Look at, look how you know marvelous I am. That, 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 uh, that. So it, it, for any clue, it's impossible to say what it reflects, right? But what you need to do is you need to look for the consistencies and patterns across other domains. But but that would that would be one possible. We yeah. have okay, we have one more question after this. The, the music question is... Yeah, if somebody just, they just seem, people who don't seem to like music at all, is there yeah. any aspect of that? Yeah, well, I mean, we, we know people who like a lot of different types of music tend to be much higher on this openness dimension. And a lot of people use music um, in order to uh, regulate their, emo their emotions. So um, it, it might be people who have less need or less, uh, uh, less inclination to try and regulate emotions, 
I don't know. What, do you have a, a thought about that? Yeah. Okay, one, one, one more question. Yes. What about, have you looked into closets or enclosed spaces, yeah. spaces that hold stuff that is not exposed? Yeah, we have, and I think we've looked at them a little bit, and I think it's really important to look at these places. So, and that, and that tells you a little bit about how how deep the orderliness and organization runs. Um, so, for example, there's a big difference, right, between and 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 uh, Eric Abramson has talked about this a lot. Uh, different varieties of mess, different varieties of type of of neatness, right? You could have neatness because you just don't do anything, or you could have neatness because you do a lot, but then you tidy it away. And so, and the same things with with mess, with looking inside his closet. So we'd look for a discrepancy here. What would be re what's really interesting are people who want neatness because they just they just want to have uh, or they want to have order in their lives, but they don't really have the deep structural. Um, uh, 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 traits in order to br I mean the traits in order to bring about a deep structural tidiness so what I would what I would be interested in is do they have neatness outside the closets but chaos inside so it's like I just I just have to get clutter away so they take this clutter and just stuff it in the cup we often find this is hey this is a really neat desk and then you look in the drawer you know and what they've done is they've opened the drawer and gone and just like <laughs> scraped everything into it and that you know and that and that's a very different brand of neatness to somebody who has everything lined up within that drawer and so on Thank you, thank you. Oh, very well, much. thanks for having me. So I think I can.